Hello, my name is Krill, also known as Discord User Bus, and today I'm going to talk about a new rendering system that I'm building for the Esoterica engine. So what is Esoterica engine? This is uh, not an engine engine, it's a MIT licensed starter game engine framework that was started by Bob Young Guelph, and I joined last year as a rendering engineer. Please go ahead and visit our wonderful website for more information. So today I'm going to talk about uh, mesh rendering in particular. We're going to talk about geometry representation. We are going to talk about what uh, concepts the renderer has and what uh, the operations are. And we're going to talk about the render passes, benefits, downsides, tips and tricks, and I will show some work in progress screenshots in the end. Let's start with some history. So I've been working on this in my free time for about a year so far. I did a custom render hardware interface implementation for graphics API portability. We have a DX12 backend live and we're planning to do a Vulkan backend later. I did the DX11 to RHI port. The render was basically rewritten from scratch. It has bindless everything, the GPU driven rendering pipeline and all the other cool buzzwords. Note that everything is still extremely work in progress but we are at a point where I am comfortable with sharing some of the underlying technology. So what the goals were? The main goals are to allow tech artists and programmers to handwrite custom shaders, to have a low memory overhead, our vertex data is compressed and we're generally very careful about allocating memory. We also want to render into multiple views simultaneously, so we support arbitrary amount of cameras, shadow maps or any other custom rendering passes than you might want. We have uh, zero CPU overhead. Instance and triangle calling is all happening on the GPU. And last but not least, we'd like to, we, we are aiming to fully saturate the GPU with work and let it do what it does best. Let's talk about geometry. Our geometry is split into clusters. I've talked about, I've talked about clusters before I assume that you're familiar with the concept. So each cluster contains up to 64 vertices and they can form up to 124 triangles. We are using the latest mesh optimizer to build and process our meshes and compute the clusters. We have an offline resource compiler that processes meshes and other resources. We have a very compact vertex format. So mesh vertices are stored as signed normal 16 bits relative to cluster center. We have 32 bytes for static vertex with two UV channels and 64 bytes for skinned mesh vertex. Coming soon, we'll have uh, support for custom vertex attributes and variable rate bit streams like in Nanite. We are storing levels of details in the mesh, but they're not continuous. So mesh is still a single resource, but it can contain an arbitrary amount of LDs. And there will be a separate video about the LD system and its goals. So here's our vertex data. Uh, there is a static mesh vertex and vertex bone data. Compressed data zero and compressed data one store positions and normals. UV0, UV1 are uncompressed UV channels, and there's also an 8-bit RGBA vertex color for it. What's interesting is uh, our shaders does not distinguish between static and skin geometry. So we are storing the vertex data in a byte address buffer, and then the shader uses typed load to load the base vertex. And then skinned meshes are handled with a dynamic branch. So this is one additional typed load at vertex address plus size of static mesh vertex location. This extra type load is typically free and both skinned and non-skinned geometry is rendered in the same draw call. We store the vertex data in two buffers. They're called cluster vertex buffer and cluster triangle buffer. Cluster vertex buffer is just a byte address buffer with the vertex data that I have discussed earlier. Cluster triangle buffer is a UNIT32 buffer that stores three 10-bit vertex indices per triangle. So we still have two bits per triangle that are available for future use. Maybe we'll use it to store it at two-sided flag or something less, like that. We're using mesh shaders for cluster processing. There is a path to implement the fallback, but this is not a high priority thing and I will talk about it later. And mesh dispatches are automatically split by 65K clusters in each dispatch. This is done in another compute dispatch, which is called bucket resolve. Uh, 
it is pretty trivial, so I will not go into details about it. What are we doing in the mesh dispatch? So the mesh dispatch is decompressing the vertex data on the fly without global memory, without touching the global memory. It is also performing additional per triangle calling. So it's doing a first time calling, back face calling, and small triangle calling for triangles that don't overlap any of the pixel centers. Uh, if the triangle does not overlap any of the pixel centers, it is not contributing to the final image and therefore it can be discarded. Backface culling allows us to have one PSO for both double-sided and regular materials, which reduces the amount of PSOs we have to compile. And also the mesh shader has access to the whole cluster and opens up uh, the option for more advanced stuff. For example, I always wanted to build a grass system using mesh shaders. We are not using task shaders. Task shaders are practically useless at this time, which will be a topic for another video. Uh, so we're doing cluster and instance calling in compute shaders instead. This approach requires to use mo more memory, but it is much better performance and much higher GPU utilization. This might change in the future, but right now task shaders are pretty set. Let's talk about mesh instances. The mesh instance is a 64 byte descriptor that contains information about what mesh we are drawing and what transform does it have. It represents one object in the world. Uh, the structure is optimized to reduce memory loads. For example, most shaders need to load an instance anyway. So we duplicate some of the mesh data uh, in the mesh instance, and this allows us to avoid loading the mesh descriptor in the cluster filtering pass. The transform struct is 10 floats. So we store float tree translation, rotation quaternion, and the float tree scale. And the buffers are 16-bit bindless uh, handles. Cluster is also a 64-byte uh, descriptor. It stores data for decompression, material and shader parameters, and also points where do we fetch the vertices from. Uh, cluster stores the global triangle and vertex offsets in the buffer. Uh, which allows us to use 10-bit um, indices which are local to this cluster. Bounding cones and bounding spheres in the cluster are used for uh, calling and they come straight from the, coming out straight from the mesh optimizer. So here is our high-level rendering overview. It is very simple conceptually. We start the frame, we then uh, call instances in the instance filtering pass. Uh, instance filtering might might be a bit of a misleading name because it also does a bunch more stuff like level of detail selection. It computes the final bounding box for each instance and stuff like that. Uh, then we also then we call clusters in the cluster filtering pass and then surrounding clusters go into the indirect mesh dispatches. Another question is how do we render shadows for multiple cameras with this setup? So let's introduce the concept of the render view. The render view represents a virtual camera and an associated render target. Uh, it is used for rendering game cameras, shadow maps, and other custom passes. So the main camera allocates one view. Each directional light allocates four views, one for each shadow cascade. As you can see, it, it stores view projection matrices, view planes, and other things. So how do we add it uh, to the system? We also store a list of visible cluster indices per each view. All our clusters are stored in a global buffer, so each cluster has a unique 32-bit index. And then the instance filtering is looping over all the render views and is doing first time calling and level of detail selection. Cluster filtering does a per cluster calling for each view and then writes cluster indices that are visible in each particular view. And then we do a mesh dispatch for each view. Sounds reasonable, but we also still, but we still need to support custom shaders. So to add shaders, we need to introduce the concept of the render bucket. The render bucket contains four buffers. First buffer is a um, one 32 bit integer that has a count of visible clusters. Second buffer has the same for the count of draw calls. Third buffer contains the draw call arguments. And then we have a one large buffer that contains uh, 
32-bit indices for all clusters that are visible in this bucket. And this, this last buffer is always allocated for the worst case. The purpose of the first two count buffers is to use them with uh, atomic increment operations operations to append data to uh, to the other two buffers. Next thing is the shader bucket. So shader bucket is essentially three render buckets. Has opaque, alpha tested and alpha blended bucket. This seems enough for now, but we might need to add more eventually. So not all buck also not all buckets are necessarily allocated because shadow maps can skip alpha blended bucket. Each render view allocates one shader bucket per shader. And this is very similar to what Alan Wake 2 and the North Light team did. So how does it fit into the rendering pipeline? Uh, well, here's a slightly inconvenient diagram that illustrates it. So on the left, we can see uh, that each render view has a viewport and the list of buckets with one bucket per shader. And then uh, the render view data is going to the instance filtering, which then goes to the cluster filtering. And then the cluster filtering is then writing, uh, is then atomically appending uh, visible cluster indices for each view for each corresponding shader bucket in that view. Then it goes through the bucket resolve and then the bucket resolve generates um, indirect dispatch arguments. And then these indirect dispatch arguments go directly into the render passes and then each render pass decides individually what to do with them. For example, the shadow cascaded shadow pass will render them once per each shadow cascade. The forward shading pass will do a depth pre-pass followed by a forward shading pass and so on and so forth. If you have other mesh rendering passes, uh, this rendering system can also be extended pretty easily with uh, your own custom mesh rendering passes. Or alternatively, if you don't need uh, mesh rendering passes, for example, if you're rendering a volume or have something custom, uh, you can also extend it with a completely separate custom rendering pass that is not uh, touching this geometry rendering pipeline. So what are the benefits and side effects of that? First of all, it has a much lower memory overhead compared to the visibility buffer and triangle filtering. Traditional visibility buffer and CTF require to store and write three 32-bit indices for each triangle for each view. And because of that, they're often not used for a per view calling, but rather per all views at once. So if a triangle is visible in one, in one view, it will be visible in all views at the same time. Our approach requires to write one 32-bit index per 124 triangles. This is dramatically lower, and this is what enables us to have a proper per view calling. So if you have a triangle that is visible in one view, but not visible in the other view, it will be only rendered into the first view. This is also completely agnostic of the type of rendering you want. So it will work equally well for both visibility buffer and forward shading. For the visibility buffer, you can use a cluster ID target instead, which should be something like 25 bit cluster ID and seven bits uh, local triangle ID, which would reference the triangle inside that particular cluster. And this even works for deferred shading, even though you should never use deferred shading. This is more benefits. So interesting side effect is that the cluster filtering shader can now quote unquote, choose what shader to use for a particular cluster. It can be very handy if you want to suddenly make something translucent. It is also pretty useful for level of detail transition blending and other similar things. It supports handwritten shaders very well and it is easy to work with. Our engine philosophy is that shaders are code, so you can add shader files to the Visual Studio solution and then share code between HLSL and C++ naturally. This has very low CPU cost. So we have one large instance filtering dispatch that does not depend on the amount of views or uh, uh, or shaders. We have one large cluster filtering dispatch, which also does not depend on the amount of views. And then we have one to three draw calls per shader per render view, which depends on your rendering passes, of course. So what it does not do well? <laughs> 
It is fundamentally incompatible with the node-based material system. Shader buckets are relatively expensive, so if you have millions of unique shaders, then don't use it. It will not work. Uh, you can follow my advice from the previous videos. You can branch on material flags and make larger shaders in general. Uh, you should watch out for VGPR pressure and occupancy. This is as you would normally do with a forward renderer anyway. And most important downside is that this needs at least a GTX 1650 or RX 57000 XT because of mesh shaders. Keep in mind that it is straightforward to implement the fallback for lower end hardware. I've tried not to use anything that would make it not portable and it should be doable. Uh, in the case of a fallback, it will be the same uh, compute based triangle filtering approach that will write three indices per triangle and it will still perform on a similar level as the previous uh, VB or CTF systems. Uh, it is not a high priority task for us at the moment. However, we will probably implement it at some point and it is also possible to, imp to support both systems at the same time and have it gracefully fall back to a CTF approach if mesh shaders are not supported on your hardware. So here's the demo. Uh, this is a relatively small level, so it has uh, 1,400 uh, mesh instances and uh, 4.5 million triangles in total. It has a main camera and four shadow cascades. Keep in mind that this is work in progress, so the actual the lightning is not implemented, only the shadow filtering and shadow sampling is implemented. This has about 0 0.2 milliseconds uh, CPU cost on a relatively high-end CPU, and this has a 1.6 milliseconds GPU cost as well on a high-level GPU. I think this demo is not really representative of what the systems can do, so as the next step, I decided to download uh, one of the Blender splash screens. So it's called ScanLens by Piotr Krinsky. You can download it from the Blender website. Uh, I directly export it to Esoterica using the Blender plugin. So each Blender object directly maps to Esoterica entity, which also includes geometry node instances. Um, plugin is still work in progress, so materials are all messed up, but it exports geometry and instances correctly. Um, here is the result in Esoterica. So this has around 200,000 instances and about 1.2 billion triangles, uh, billion with a B. And then the CPU cost is fixed at 0 0.2 milliseconds and we have a GPU cost of about 4.2, 4 4.0 milliseconds for this particular view. The breakdown is that it takes 0 0.7 milliseconds instance filtering, 3.0 milliseconds cluster filtering, and then uh, as far as the rendering goes, like it's just limited by the amount of triangles the rasterizer can handle. Uh, coming soon, we'll have more optimizations. We are planning for a GPU-driven occlusion cowing, which should help in this particular case. And we are planning for a hierarchical uh, calling system that will help to reduce the instance and cluster filtering costs. Here are a few references and further uh, reading materials. They will also be linked in the video description. And thank you, that's all I had. So renderer is work in progress and it will be an open source release eventually. I'll make more videos on the GPU driven material system, the lightning and decals, global illumination and other features that we're planning for Esoterica. And please let me know in the comments if there is anything particular that you want to know about. Thank you and have a good day.